All right, turn with, turn with me to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. By the way, um, this morning also I um, did a thought of the week in the previous section. You can listen to that online if you want to. We're going to go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. But I did a, 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 a little thought this morning on press on. You know, and the fact that this world offers, our, offers us nothing, you know, uh, that we can press on toward. And so what we need to press on is toward the mark for the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And so you can listen to that if you want to. Also, as before we start preaching on 2 Timothy chapter, chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, I just wanted to say, if Bill and Patty Porter is listening to this message, we've been trying to get hold of you guys. Please contact us or contact me so that we just, everybody's been asking how you guys are doing. So Bill and Patty Porter, please contact us. Uh, hopefully you listen to this message and then uh, we can make contact. All right. Second Timothy chapter 3. As you turn there, let's open in prayer. Father, thankful for your grace. We are thankful for being our Father. We're thankful for the life that we have in your Son and that we can, out of our lives, are hit with Christ in you, Father. We're thankful for that security that we have. We're thankful for the finished work of your Son in his death, his burial, and resurrection, and the security that we have of, everlast for, of eternal life. We praise you and we thank you for that. We thank you for your word that we can consider, that you have given for us, to us by inspiration, but also that you have preserved for us, that we this morning can open our Bibles in the English language and read them, and as we trust and believe that the King James Bible is, your, is the inerrant, perfect, preserved word of God. We're thankful for that, that we can have that in our hands, and we can trust it 100%. As we continue to consider your word this morning, we pray that... Um, um, that uh, we're thankful that you're going to give us understanding, and we're thankful as we believe your word, it works in us effectually that believes. Amen. All right, so we're in Second Timothy. Last week I started a message called All, uh, um, all Scripture, the Prophet of All Scripture, is the message that we had last week, is the Prophet of All Scripture. And we talked about the fact, I'm going to read, let's read 16 and 17 there, or let's go back from verse 14. 2 Timothy 3, verse 14 says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is, in, in, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So how much of Scripture is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness? How much of Scripture? All of Scripture. And when he says all of Scripture, last week I talked about that our God given us, it's given it by inspiration, and that all there means all. It means Genesis through Revelation. It doesn't mean just Romans through Philemon. It means all of Scripture is profitable for us. We learn through Scriptures. All of Scriptures. And I'm not going to go through all of that again this morning, but it's profitable for us. The word profitable in your Bible means it's gainful. It's helpful and highly valuable. And I said last week, it needs to be valued more than silver or than what? Of gold. Yeah, than fine gold. Go with me to Psalm chapter 19, if you will. The book of Psalms. Psalms chapter 19. <clears throat> it's important that we know that we have a complete whole Bible. You know, sometimes, and I know how it is, because if you look at my Bible this morning and you look at what my Bible looks like, you're going to see there's a certain section of my Bible that seems to be very worn out, and the other section is not so worn out, okay? And that's because our focus as the body of Christ, because of our instruction, because the doctrine being given to us, is in Romans through Philemon, so we tend to spend more time there. However, that doesn't mean we should not be spending time. We should be spending time in all of Scripture. We need to know the whole counsel of God, okay? But in Philippians, uh, in, in Psalm chapter 19, look at what the psalm writer says in verse 7. He says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. 
The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous all together. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, much more than much. Uh, sorry, more they desire. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. There is definitely great reward in keeping God's word. That means believing it, meditating upon it profiting from it because God's word profits us and it has to be desired more than silver than or than gold definitely has to be desired more than that you're going to have to give your life you know I was watching this thing on this documentary slash program I don't know it's reality programs and I think it's called you can't find gold and these guys go into in, into in, 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 in Canada and they go dig up for fine gold and just and they just dig up all that dirt and they get that little speckles of fine dirt at the end and then they weigh it up and after moving tons and tons and tons and thousands of tons of earth they get this few ounces of gold out of that and they just give everything for that you know the bible says and if you think about the focus and what they gave up to do all of that you know the bible says more to desire than self so everything that we have needs to be focused on God's Word and to know His Word and to get into His Word and get understanding from His Word. We need to be focused on that. But Paul, as he's preaching, as he started his preaching in the book of Acts, as he goes through the book of Acts, Paul has never shunned to declare the whole counsel of God. When I say the whole counsel of God, he's not just saying Romans through Philemon. He t taught the whole counsel of God. So let's look at a couple of passages there. If you go with me to Ephesians, and by the way, this is very profitable for us, and we need to take note of that. Ephesians chapter, chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. <clears throat> Let's go read there from verse 6. In Ephesians chapter 1 and from verse 6. To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted, in the beloved so God the Father have made you and I that has trusted Christ trusted the gospel he has made us accepted in the beloved and the beloved is the one that went through his death burial and resurrection okay he's the beloved son in whom we have redemption through his blood through the blood of Christ the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. God has abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. All wisdom and prudence. We can know from God's word the wisdom and prudence that we need and what God had. Verse 9 says, Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So ultimate purpose with God's wisdom and prudence is to gather all things together in one, things on earth and things in heaven, together in one in Christ Jesus ultimately okay that's his ultimate plan verse 11 says in whom also we have obtained an inheritance inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh what's the next two words you see there all things after the counsel of his own will so all things that God has worked out the counsel of His will is for us to have to, the, to be to the praise of His glory. Okay, not just us, but who else? The nation of Israel, God's purpose for the earth and God's purpose for the heaven. That's the counsel of God's will to do all of this. And by the way, as I said last week, you cannot have. It's impossible for you and I to have Romans through Philemon 
without having Genesis through Malachi, without having Mark through John and having Acts. You cannot have Romans through Philemon. It will not make any sense to you. It will not have any footing anywhere. It cannot stand on its own. It, rather, what it does, it brings together all the counsel of God's will so that we can clearly see it. We don't have to look through a glass darkly anymore. We can see it as face to faith. We can clearly see all the purpose and counsel of God's word. Okay? His purpose for Israel and his purpose for the body of Christ. We can see it all. And Paul declared that. Go with me to Romans. Uh, no, sorry, not Romans. The book of Acts. Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. And that's why I am saying, and that's why I am suggesting that the Word of God is profitable. All of God's Word. There's passages that I read right back, I can start reading right back in Genesis, and there's the purpose, and there's a doctrine of God's creation. There's a doctrine of man. There's a doctrine of sin. There's all these things that has been in there in the Scriptures. Then there's reproof, and there's correction. There's instruction in righteousness. It's all over the Scriptures. It's not new information that Paul has been revealed to. What Paul has been revealed to is the body of Christ, God in us, the body of Christ, and the purpose and intent of having a vehicle and, and, and a body that is going to be, that he's going to reclaim his authority back in the heavenly places. That's you and I. That's the secret. In Acts chapter 20, from verse 20, Paul is he's speaking to these elders that he's meeting at Miletus of Ephesian, Ephes, Ephesian elders that he's meeting at Miletus. In verse 20 he says, And now I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. Remember I said all of Scripture is given by the Spirit and it's profitable. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16. Now he says, I have kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. So if, if he was not keeping back anything that was profitable unto you, that means he declared unto them, all of scriptures. But he has known up to that time, at least up to that time, as he's progressively getting revelation of it. Profitable unto you, but I've showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. That means, you know, that house to house ministry is not going knocking on every door and say, hey, have you received Christ? Have you trusted Christ? That's not the house to house he's talking about here. He's talking about believers meeting in homes and going to see those believers and taught the believers from house to house. Okay. Now, I don't have a problem if you want to go to house to house. I'm not saying I have a problem with that. I'm saying, but if you say this verse says we have to go knock on doors, that's not what the verse is saying. Verse 21 says, Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witness in every city, saying that bound, bonds and afflictions abide me. You know, Paul is like the only thing that he do know and that has been testified to them is bonds and afflictions will abide him. You know, that's like encouraging to go to the next place because the only thing that's going to abide you is bonds and afflictions. You know, you and I would be like, I'm me, I'm like, ah, okay, I'm signing out, okay? It's just canceling my trip because it's bond and afflictions. I'm not doing this, okay? But that's what Paul went through. That's what God told him he's going to be saved unto in Acts chapter 9. Verse 24, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. So the kingdom of God he's preaching here, he's talking about here, he's talking about the overall kingdom of God. He's not talking about the kingdom of the nation of Israel and his, his millennium kingdom. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the kingdom of God. Everything. And Paul uses the term kingdom of God at least 13 times in his epistles. Okay. The kingdom of God shall see my face no more, verse 26. Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all, to declare unto you all the counsel of what? God. 
That word counsel, the purpose, the will, God's advice, what God is doing. He is not shown to declare all the counsel of God. Okay? And so he has been preaching all of Scripture. And when Paul says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable, he's talking about of all Scripture. He's not just saying Romans through Philemon. And sometimes we get into the trap of thinking that. Okay? And I know as mature believers we don't get in a trap because we have all Scriptures. My question to you is, how much time, I guess we need to ask first of all, how much time, I'm going, to, I'm going to make this question to all of us, not just to you. How much time do we spend reading the Scriptures, number one? Number two is, how much time do we spend reaching Romans through Philemon, the specifically epistles written to us and about us? And number three is, how much time do we spend reading all of Scripture? Okay? And it's important that we get to read all of Scripture. Okay? Today, you know, we find children today, they don't even, they don't even know who's, who, who is um, Sarah and Abraham. They don't even know who's Joseph, Leah and Rebecca. And, you know, they have no clue who these people are. Okay? And so we need to teach the whole counsel of God, the whole word of God. And so t God says, uh, you know, Paul says, go back with me to, second, uh, to Timothy, in First and Second Timothy. Paul tells in First Timothy chapter 4, all Scripture is profitable. All Scripture is profitable. And as we consider Scripture, it profits us. It definitely profits us. It's helpful. It's highly valuable. And it's gainful for me. Okay? It gains me. It's just like if you have an investment and it's turned out a 25% increase in your investment, it's a profitable investment. But if you get 0.25%, on the money that you have out there, keep it in the trunk under the bed, man. You know? There's not much of a profit in that. You know? But Paul says to Timothy, verse 13 of First Timothy chapter 4, Till I come give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by, the prophecy, by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things, Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. So as we give ourselves to the Scriptures, as we meditate upon the Scriptures, as we read the Scriptures, it profits us. And as we get profited by it, how, much, how does it profit us? How does the Scripture profit us when we read and meditate upon it? It works. It's alive. It's God's Word that effectually worketh in us that believes. And it, and it results in profit in my life. My walk starts and my conversation starts walking according to the counsel of God's will. And I'm proving the will of God in my life as the Word of God works in me. And so when I'm profiting from it, others, my profiting appears to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. You know, not just salvation on eternal life. He's talking about salvation from this present world and from the circumstances and pressures that Timothy is facing himself with. How to deal with it. You know, if there's any, any time in history and that our history that we know of our lives that we can be profitable and if there's any, any time a group of people that could be possible in a world right now that is in distress... It should be you and I as Bible believers. You and I that understand who we are in Christ. Understanding our own eternal destiny. Understanding that we are, in, we are hit with Christ in God. Knowing the hope that is laid for us. Knowing what is laying ahead of us. As we know it, we should be profitable to all. Well, let me warn you, when we jump on the bandwagon of the world's way, we're not profitable to anybody. We just make people more negative, more anxious. But we have the Word of God that works in us effectually. And so our prophet appears to all as we meditate on it and we save ourselves. 
and we can stand secure because of we know God's Word. Because all Scripture, 2 Timothy chapter 3 says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, all of it, and it's all profitable. It's all profitable if you rightly divide it. If you do not rightly divide it, you're going to run in the trouble of not rightly dividing the word of truth. And if you're not rightly dividing the truth, you're going to get some spiritual input, but it will be spiritual lies. Just this morning, somebody sent me a text that long, you know, about we have to take hands together with believers and we need to claim in the name of Jesus that this virus will be bound together and just along. And, 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 and if we want to truly be blessed with God, only those that's going to take hands with other people and pray together for this virus to pass, only us will get blessed by God. You know, and it's just like, and they quoted some passages from the Old Testament. And you know what? I wrote them back and I said, where in the Bible does it tell you to have a prayer chain? Where in the Bible does it tell you to do all these things to get an answer from God? Because the thinking is the more people we have, the more we can twist God's arm to change something. When God is not physically intervening and changing the circumstances of the world. Anyway, that's off the track now. But we know God's Word. And it's all profitable for me. Go back with me to Psalms quickly. Go back with me to Psalms. And I can see I'm not going to get into my passages where I wanted to get this morning, but anyway, that's okay. That's okay. That means I've got something to preach next week again, you know. So <laughs> Somebody was telling me this week, you know, because they wanted me to do a message on, Wednesday, on Sunday night, on uh, Friday night with a group up in Chicago. And I'm like, you know, you've got a whole week for your wife to write out your message and, you know, prepare it for you, you know, so... Anyway, it's a joke, internal joke. My wife doesn't write my messages. Psalms. The book of Psalms. Just, I just want to read you a passage here. Psalm 97. Oh, sorry, sorry. Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Did I say 119? Nope. Psalm 119. I've been spending quite a bit of time in Psalms here. My wife and I have been spending quite some time in here. And, and look at this, the psalm writer seems to be very anxious about stuff. He's got a lot of pressure, people oppressing him. He's got a lot of difficulty he's facing. And, 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 you know, he's afflicted and all these things is happening to the psalm writer. And as he's writing this, look at what he says. Where's his, where's his answer? What does he want at the end of the day? L listen to this. Verse 97. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Remember we just said to Timothy, you must meditate upon these things. All the day. Thou through thy commandments hast made me wiser. I'm in verse 98 now of Psalm 119. Thou through thy commandments hast made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. God's commandments is always with him, so it makes him wiser than his what? Enemies. And I'm sure his enemies are ever with him too. Okay. I have more understanding than all my teachers. For thy testimonies are my meditation. Verse 100. I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. Who's the ancients he's talking about? Is he talking about people way before Genesis? Or is he talking about his people from time back? I know more than that. I have, he says, I, where am I? 100. I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. As he keeps God's word, as he meditates upon it, he understands more than they ever understood. Why? Because they didn't keep his precepts. They didn't keep his word. And if you want to you understand more than any other way around you, you and I need to get into the scriptures. The word of God. 101. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. He says, I have refrained my feet from evil ways that I might keep thy word. You know what? When you start getting into evil ways, the evil ways will get a hold of you, drag you down, and you know what you're going to lose, by the way? is the word of God. So you have to make the wise and prudent decision not to go into the evil way and keep the word of God. 
I have not departed from thy judgment, for thou hast taught me. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Ever eat honey? Some people, some people, you know, some of you enjoy, I enjoy honey. Especially if it's on a comb still, you know, and I take a piece out, put it in my mouth, and I just, you know, chew on that a little bit till there's no more taste and spit that, you know, core out there. But that taste of honey is just so sweet and it's so good and it just gives you a good old feelings like eating chocolate, you know. It's like, it's like, you know, it's like really good, you know, but anyway. <laughs> the what? Better than chewing gum, yes. So, you know, when you eat it, it's, but he says, the words of God is sweeter than honey to my mouth. That means it just not inflicts, uh, 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 that doesn't just make me, by the way, you know, people say, you know, don't eat chocolates, it's not good for you. That is a lie. Because it's good for your soul. You feel good when you eat chocolate, okay? <laughs> when you eat something good, you just feel good, you know? But when you eat God's Word, it does have that effect where it makes you just sweeter, just that, that goodness that feels over you, you know? Through my precepts, I get under, thy precepts, I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and light unto my path. And so we can carry on and on upon. It's everything for the psalm writer is about God's Word. His meditation, he wanting to know it. God to teach him his, his ways, to walk in that. Because if he's not going to do that, it will take him away. It will give him over to his afflictors. It's going to give him over to those that, uh, that, 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 that bothers him and his enemies. And in his own ways. And he doesn't want to do that. So God's Word, is all of Scripture is profitable for us. Go back now with me to Second Timothy. Second Timothy, that was just a little bit of extra there. But in Second Timothy chapter 3, you guys all with me? So we're going to learn some things about, he says, all Scripture, verse 16, all Scripture, and verse 16 says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and we talked about inspiration of God, and we talked about what profitable is, and raise of God, and is profitable for the following. Doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. That's what it's profitable for. And doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness is for the man of God to be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. All right? So what is doctrine? What is doctrine? And sometimes, you know, I find myself when I speak to people... I use the word doctrine because it's something that I'm learning from the Scriptures. And I'm like, doctrine? I'm like, oh, does, does that person know what doctrine means? Because it can sound like I'm like, oh, you talking about doctrine, doctrine, doctrine? You know? And doctrine just means what is taught, what has been teached, what, what, is, what is taught. It's the function of the words. Doctrine is the function of the words. Okay, you read what has been taught and it, as a function, okay, of the words. It's the truths and principles that we have in God's Word when we talk about doctrine. It's instruction and confirmation of truth. It's what doctrine is. It's what it teaches. It's, what, it's, it's, it's the function of what it produces. Okay? Reproof. Now, by the way, you can find doctrine in time past passages. Doctrine for Israel. But there's even doctrine for you and I in those passages. That we can understand some things about who God is and how man deals with God. We can see the instruction there, okay? We know, I know that I'm not under the law. I know that I'm not under a performance-based system with a contract with God under the law. I understand that. And so I see the doctrine of God for the nation of Israel there, but I'm learning from that too, from that doctrine. Because the thing is that we learn about God as we look at the Scriptures, God does not change. And the way that he deals with man, he deals in various different ways with man at different times. However, God does not change. And, and what God expects from man to respond to what God says is also always the same. God wants man to respond by faith. That doesn't change. And God's not unreasonable. He's just. He's righteous. And He can't expect one group to do more than the other group could not possible do. Because He's God. 
Okay, he doesn't change. So, doctrine. Reproof. Reproof is the blame expressed to one's face. Censure for a fault. That word censure means reprimand, criticism for a fault. To convict bad behavior. Have, a, you, have any one of you ever read the Word of God? Doesn't matter where you've read it, and you come and you say, Ooh, I'm behaving badly. You know? I'm vain. That makes me proud. Ooh, I'm reading Proverbs and ooh, ouch. That, you know, and it reproves me. Correction. The act of correcting to bring back from error or deviation, or, or deviation from the error to truth. Okay? And then instruction in righteousness. That means to educate. But that instruction in righteousness also means to chastise or discipline. To comprehend what is right, holy, and what is just. God's standard of right. Okay? And so instruction are in righteousness. That is what God's Word does. Now, if you're going to only go to Romans to Philemon, you're going to run into some trouble because there are some other scriptures that is for your learning and for your comfort and for your hope. That's what Romans chapter 15 verse 4 say. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Bear with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. You guys know this passage. I've read this passage before, but I want to, I'll just read it to you again to make the point of all scripture. By the way, and I mentioned this last week and the week before, I think, how many times, how many times does, does Paul quote Old Testament scripture, Isaiah and, Gen and all various scriptures and Psalms? How many, a lot, right? A lot. You know, I've done some study on it some long time ago, and I can't remember, but I, I think it was like over 160 times. 160, more than 160 times he's quoting. I think 167, but I could be wrong. He's quoting the Scriptures. All the script, different Scriptures, okay? So it's important. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. All the Scriptures profitable for us, for these areas. Moreover, brethren, verse 1. I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Who's he talking about? Israel, right? Verse 3. And did eat the same spiritual meat and did drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was who? Christ. Verse 5, But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. So he's, he's telling you something about who? Israel as they are going through the wilderness, and how God was not pleased with them. Now these things, verse 6 says, Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things. So whose examples are they? Ours. He's not saying forget the Old Testament. He says, now go look, let's look at the Old Testament and learn something from this. Because it's for our ensembles. It's for our comfort. It's for our hope. It's for our patience. It's for all that's what the Scriptures are doing. Verse, verse um, he says, to the intent we should not lust after our evil things as they also lusted. Could we lust? No, we maybe not lust for quails, but what will we lust for? Something else, you know. Neither be ye idolatrous as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. When they played with the golden calf, right? Now is there any people in, ours, in the body of Christ that can turn to idolatry? We eat and play and it's not the same. We don't have a golden calf, but we have a square screen possibly with uh, various other influence in our lives, you know. Verse 8. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. That's when Balaam. That's Numbers 25. Twenty-three thousand people died 
because of fornication. Don't you do that, says the Bible. Don't get in. They are in samples. Verse 9. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them tempted and were destroyed of the serpents. They got tired of manna. Started complaining. Verse 10. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things. Now by the way, murmuring is I think one of the things that most believers know very well of. A lot of believers know very well of murmuring. Okay? With lots of murmurings. Now all these things happen unto them for ensamples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore let him thinketh that he standeth, take heed lest he fall. Would you say that this passage is important for us to take note of? Would you say it's important for us to go back and read what has actually happened here in time past? Because it's our ensamples. It's for our admonition. And upon whom the angels of the Lord have come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he stand, stand and think heed lest he fall. Because here comes Israel out of Egypt. They're moving out of Egypt. God brings them out. They brings them through the sea. The enemies come through. He kills them all. And you're the other side of it. Imagine Israel's heart at the other side of the sea. Woo! Look at God it for us. He brought us out of there. He killed these enemies. Look at us. We're God's people. He's giving birth to His nation. That's who we are. And it didn't take them very long to start murmuring, complaining, and fornicating. God brings them through that wilderness of 40 years. They go into the land. And what do they do in the land? God says, kill everybody in the land. Clean it out. Do they do that? No. Do they end up with a Moabite woman and fornicated with them? Yes. And here were they God's people, God's children. And here are you and I, the body of Christ. And we have to be careful. However, the scripture carries on in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 13 says, There, there have no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. So, the temptation that he's talking about is temptation of what? Lust and all the things that he's just talked about. There's no temptation that's taking you such as common to man. So this, all these type of things that you see here is common to man. That's how man acts and thinks and responds. You get what I'm saying? But God is faithful who will not suffer you. That word suffer means to allow you. Will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. So there's nothing that you and I as believers today, being complete in Christ, having His imputed righteousness, having His word to us, that we cannot deal with. Because He's equipped us in Christ to actually deal with these temptations. But to do that, we need to give attention to what? To the truth of God's Word. There is no temptation taken you, but such as common to man. But God is faithful, will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. There is nothing going to come above that you cannot. You, everything is going to come your way as a believer. You can what? Handle. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. That temptation is going to come. He says, ah, oh, this is a temptation of my flesh. This is what I want to do. Like, just like Israel did. But you know what? Of who I am in Christ, because of God's Word working in me, I can bear with it, and I'm going to say no. The wisdom and prudence from God's Word that I've seen Him bringing through all the counsel of God is that this, the wisdom says that's evil, Prudence says, you know what I'm going to do? Instead of going down this road, because wisdom tells me that if I go through that door, I'm going to go through that door, a snake's going to bite me. That says wisdom tells me there's a snake that will bite you and a poisonous snake, and I'm possibly going to get killed if I go through that door. Prudence says, 
That's what the wisdom is saying. I'm going to go out that door instead of that door. That's the choice I'm going to make. But I'm going to make that choice based on the wisdom that I have from God's Word. I foresee the evil in prudence and turn from it. That's what Proverbs talk about prudence. You understand what I'm saying? Wisdom and prudence are not the same thing. Wisdom tells you what it is and the result can be. Prudence says, how do you get away from that and not end up where the wisdom says you could end up possibly at? And that's why all the counsel of God's Word is important for us. And I did not even get into my message for this week. Now for you and I, the body of Christ, we have, obviously we have all Scripture written for us, but not all Scripture written to us and about us. Do you understand that? What we have is the 13 Pauline epistles that's written specifically for us, for our establishment. And we're going to look at the next message because I don't think I'm going to start it because I'm not even going to get into it. But in the next message, we're going to look at this, 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 this establishment of the believer, how God, for you and I, through Romans for Lehman, establishes us. Okay? That's not saying forsaking the rest of the Bible, but specifically at Paul's epistles, how it establishes us, how it edifies us. And as we see it in the Bible, that, you know, the, the information, you can't, Neither should you go straight to Ephesians and find the doctrine of Ephesians if you don't know what Romans is about. You need the foundation. If you want to build a house, if you want to erect an edifice, you've got to lay a good, solid foundation. That's what the book of Romans is going to give us. Once you have the foundation, you're going to have to go to the body of the house where you're going to live in the areas you can live. It's the body of Christ, the church. And then ultimately, you've got to put a roof on your glorification of that building that finishes it off. It's our ultimate glorification in the heavens for eternity. And the Pauline epistles is laid out very interesting in light of what Paul is saying, that all Scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be truly furnished. And we're going to learn about that. And God's purpose for, for, the, for the cross, for the church, and the coming of Christ. As the person, you know, the book of Thessalonians, you, so if you study Paul's epistles, one of the first books that Paul wrote is Galatians and, and Thessalonians. You don't start off with Thessalonians because Thessalonians is something that's going to come in later concerning our catching away and also the coming of the Lord. Okay? You only you, you start hearing the foundations of the cross and then the mystery truth, slowly but surely by the end of Romans, uh, Romans, the book of Romans, here is now the revelation of the mystery, what God has now accomplished. And then he tells you about the mystery, which is the church, the body of Christ. But that comes after Romans. The word mystery doesn't appear in your Bible until Romans 16.25, the closing verses. So you can't study Ephesians if you don't, you can, but you're going to be ill-equipped concerning your foundation, who you are, and your identity. Because Ephesians is not going to reteach everything that is taught in Romans. You have to have the foundation so you can build upon it. And then Romans, you have 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and then you have Galatians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. The 1st Corinthians, they departed from the cross. They behaved badly in their own flesh. And they have to be reproved. When you get to Galatians, they departed from the cross, they went back to the law, and they have to be corrected, for they are wrong in their doctrine. And so we're going to look at this. Then you get Ephesians. In Ephesians, again, you have the doctor now of the church, with Jesus Christ as the head of the church, the body. And us in Him. And then you get to Philippians. Reproof again. Because the Philippians have no unity. There seems to be issues of lacking of unity among them. Then you go to the book of Colossians. And now again we see the Colossians has been influenced by people with a Jewish mind saying you have to willful worshipping of angels and keeping holy days and Sabbath days. No! We are free from the law. You the church, you, you connected to the head. You must hold the head. You don't hear about the head in Romans, but you hear about it in Ephesians and in Colossians. And then you get to First and Second Thessalonians, and now he talks about the coming. 
Now after first and second Thessalonians, there is no more church epistles written to churches. Now it's written to the overseers of local churches, and it's regarding the order and establishment of the local church in light of what he's been saying from Romans to Thessalonians. It's designed. It, looks, it works well. You, you know, and so you, you shouldn't be studying it chronologically. That's why God has placed it in His Word the way He's placed it in His Word. Now, I'm not saying that you cannot find doctrine in Philippians and you cannot find doctrine in Galatians. Philippians and Galatians and, 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 and Corinthians is all based on doctrine. So we're going to look at that next time when we're going to come. And I've got, I'll just give you a foretaste here of what's coming. And uh, we're talking about establishment of the believer. We're going to have that. Then I'm going to show you here the issue of the cross and faith, what, the, the, what it's dealing with about faith. We're going to talk about the grace orientation, the foundation. We're going to talk about the church motivated by love and, and the love of Christ to know and understand it so you can understand His purpose for the, for the, for the, for the church, the goal of God's grace. We're going to look at His coming. We're going to um, look at the scriptures of the prophets. Now what you see here is Romans 16.25. My gospel of preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery and the scriptures of the prophets for His glory. It's the edifice that He's putting together there. The glory of God. And then we're going to go first and second Timothy. We have that same things that we talked about here. Reproof, correction, strife, righteousness. And we're going to look at the various functions of how they fit in in those books. That's what we're going to do next week, or endeavor to do next week. It's a lot of information. Because there's a lot of verses that I want to run you to see the themes and the orientation that they have. <laughs> anyway, well, let's close in prayer. Father, we're thankful for this time we could spend. We thank you for all of your word that is profitable for us. I know, Father, it sounds, seems like we have not said much today, but we've actually said a lot. But we thank you for your word, and we pray that we always will keep and, and keep in your word and keep studying your word and keep meditating upon it and keep wanting to know it more and more because it is what keeps us sane in this crazy world. It's what keeps us with a hope and gives us security. We don't want to be caught up in this world, Lord, and we pray that we will set our affection on things above, that we'll press toward the mark for the price of, the, of, a, of your high calling in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Thank you for our security. Thankful for the scriptures that works in us effectually. And as we go out this week, we pray that we will not neglect your word, that we'll give attention to all scriptures as we pray this in all scripture, as we pray this by Christ with thanksgiving. Amen.